r slash no sleep posted by you slash nikki underscore 20. they found some odd graffiti on the walls of the old la du hotel every working stiff on staff at the la du hotel knew about the man with the hatchet i thought it was a load of garbage a patois of urban legend construction site tall tales and the inherent creepiness of an old building particularly one in downtown los angeles once upon a time the La Du was a gold-leaf den of luxury frequented by movie stars and foreign dignitaries. It devolved into a flea bag with comb-stained sheets between the 60s and 70s, stood abandoned and crumbling by 1985, then was snatched up in 2019 by the Hassan Group, an out-of-state hospitality conglomerate taking advantage of city incentives to revitalize Spring Street. By then, the La Du had been bank property for over three decades, and the bank was not known for taking good care of its properties. It was a real snake pit before remodeling started. The first round of construction workers found used syringes, exploded pipes leaking filthy black water down the walls, rotting food crawling with cockroaches, and uncommissioned artwork all over every flat surface, courtesy of local street gangs. Then there was the man with the hatchet. They found him on the second floor, forever in profile on the south wall. Someone, for some reason, had painted the crude black silhouette of a man on the cracked plaster, holding an axe with both hands over his head, in triumph, said some, in surrender, said others. He seemed to shoot out of the floor, and he had no feet. It appeared as though his feet had been cut off at the ankles. The construction workers didn't like him much. Most felt uneasy when looking directly at the man with the hatchet. The jumpiest of the group went so far as to insist they'd seen him move. Out of the corner of an eye, he'd be. Out of place. Sometimes turned around, sometimes with the hatchet hanging at his side. But by second glance, he'd moved back to his original position. They tore out the carpet. They rewired the electricity. They slopped layer after layer of primer on the walls, then pale yellow. But even after five coats, the faint outline of the man with the hatchet on the second floor could still be seen through the paint. No matter, it was decided. The decorator shoved an antique chest of drawers up against the wall, and no one was the wiser. The revitalized hotel opened in mid-2021. I, slumming my way through a gap year between liberal arts college and law school, took a job working the graveyard shift. It was a pretty easy gig. Sure, I had to deal with the occasional over-friendly transient or sloppy drunk, but most nights I spent poring over my LSAT study book and answering the occasional phone call from a guest with a bug up their ass. The La Du was a month into its comeback when I received my first odd call. Business had been consistent but south of mind-blowing since our soft open. That weekend, however, there was a large finance event at the convention center, something with tech and synergy in the title, and we were booked solid. The call came at 2 a.m. on Saturday from a guest I'll call Lois, an investment banker in town for the conference, staying alone in room 212. Can you tell the neighbors to keep it down? Lois snapped. It sounds like they're smacking something with a stick. My fucking door is shaking. It was a weird complaint. I hadn't heard anything from my desk, and I could hear a toilet flush on the third floor. The old walls were thin. But, for the sake of due diligence, I went upstairs to investigate. Nothing. The halls were silent and still as a tomb. I went back to my desk, under the impression Lois was either seeking attention or batshit. Two hours later, I was jolted from a cat nap by the lobby phone ringing again. Are you kidding me? I recognized Lois's voice. There it it again. Thump, thump, thump. It's four in the fucking morning. Make it stop. Again, I dragged myself upstairs. I went right to room 212, stood there with my eyes closed and my ears peeled, even pressed my ear to the door. I heard the creak of someone turning on their mattress. Then nothing. Later Saturday morning, as I was half-assing the last of my tasks before the morning guy took over, a bony brunette in her thirties with a round face and a wrinkled grey pantsuit stumbled into the lobby. And when I say stumbled, I mean she half fell, half slid down the stairs in dumpy flats. From her heavy eyes and pinched frown, I deduced this was Lois. She made a limping beeline for my desk. Did you manage to get some sleep? I asked, with as much sympathy as I could scrounge up at 7 am, Lois tossed me a pouty glare. Of course not. Every 15 minutes, the idiot was at it again. Thump, thump, thump. And what is wrong with your beds? I woke up today, and my feet are killing me. I apologized for her distress and promised a discount. I would have moved her or directed her to another hotel but, thanks to the conference, there wasn't a free room in a 10 mile radius. Just after midnight, Sunday, everything got stranger. Five minutes into my shift, I looked up to see Lois plodding her way down the stairs, appearing even messier than she had in the morning. Descending slowly and laboriously, 
she clung to the railing like a crutch, her face contorting with each step. Finally, painfully, she made it to my desk. Hey you, she said to me, have you noticed any unsavory people hanging around? Drunks, stalkers, druggies, whatever? I shook my head. Why do you ask? She leaned in close. Her face was blanched, her eyes were bloodshot, and her breath was sour. You're going to think I'm crazy, she said discreetly, but I keep on getting that weird, tingly feeling that someone is watching me. And I swear, in the hallway, I saw a shadow move. But there was no one there but me. I pitched another apology speech and said I'd keep an eye out. She thanked me, turned, and began her lumbering ascent back to room 212. Three hours later, I heard the scream. The scream came from upstairs. I ran for the night security guard, a gregarious meathead named Bill, and, together, we searched for the source. We didn't have to look far. Lois, dressed in a nightgown, huddled on the floor against the wall on the second floor, a blubbering heap. Several other guests had rushed out of their rooms. They hovered, impotently, in a confused circle. The woman in 210, Lois's co-worker, was trying to calm her down. Upon seeing Bill's uniform, Lois's dark rimmed eyes bulged. She rolled onto her feet, got a half foot off the ground, and fell back down with a pain cry. There was a man in my room, she sobbed. I, I saw him standing over me. He had an axe. Did you happen to see what this man looked like? Bill asked, reaching for his radio. Lois shook her head. It was too dark. I just woke up, and this dark, shadowy figure was right above me. I screamed and ran. It was determined that none of the other lodgers had seen this man. No shadowy figure with an axe had come through the lobby, the second floor windows don't open, and the emergency back exit trips the fire alarm. Thus, Bill and I came to the conclusion that the mad assailant must still be in room 212. The story of the man with the hatchet fluttered in my head. I'm sure it kicked at Bill's conscious as well, we both heard the same fish stories. We shared a half second of wild, anxious eye contact before the crazy flew out our ears and we remembered we were not only adults, but the professionals expected to control the situation. Bill nodded. Hand on his nightstick, me at his elbow, he opened the door of room 212 and flipped on the light. We saw nothing. No deranged axe man in the room. No deranged axe man in the closet, or in the bathroom, or under the bed. Window shut tight. The other guests rolled their eyes and shuffled back off to bed. Lois was a wreck, her co-worker in 210 let her sleep in her room. Bill returned to the front door, I returned to my desk, and we all enjoyed a quiet, boring rest of the night. At 6.30 am, I was rudely torn from the logic problem I'd been pretending solved by the jangle of the lobby phone. On the other end was a shrill female voice. This. This is Kate Wong, the woman stammered. Room 210. I need an ambulance. Now. I didn't ask questions. I put Kate Wong on hold, dialed 911, radioed Bill the security guard to keep a lookout for the paramedics, grabbed our dusty first aid bag and dashed up the stairs to room 210. Lois lay on her friend's couch. Frizzy brown curls stuck to her shiny round face, flushed and swollen with tears. Her pastel pink nightgown clung, soggy and darkened, to her clavicles. The thin sheet she'd thrown over herself was similarly moistened, tangled, and hiked up to her knobby knees. I started towards her with a first aid bag. She hollered at me to stay away. I caught sight of her feet, and I almost puked. Her feet looked like two gobs of chewed bubblegum on a dirty park bench. Swollen patches of raw pink cauliflower flesh from her ankles to her soles, surrounded by tough, black, leathery skin. Her left heel was, gone, in its place a crater of bulging red globs and dried yellow discharge, ringed by thick white dead skin. The two littlest toes on her right foot were shriveled and black and ashy at the ends, like cigarette butts discarded in an ashtray. My feet are burning. She screamed. My feet are burning. The paramedics arrived. I was unceremoniously hustled to the hallway as they lifted Lois onto a backboard, carried her down the stairs, strapped her onto their gurney, and hauled ass to good Sam, sirens wailing. Eighteen hours later, Kate Wong strode back through the doors of the Ladu. It was shortly after midnight, Monday, right as I clocked in. She'd been at the hospital all day. She came to my desk to thank me, and to offer a rudimentary, if unsatisfying, conclusion to the saga of Lois and the mysterious axe-wielding creeper. Lois was going to be staying in town a little longer than she'd planned to. The doctors didn't know exactly what was wrong with her, their best guess was some mutant breed of aggressive staph infection. Complications of untreated type 2 diabetes had also been tossed around. One way or another, during her two-night stay at the Ladue, 
the tissue and blood vessels of Lois lower extremities had sustained irreparable damage, and now, amputation was the only option. They were going to remove both of her feet. Hack them off at the ankles. I don't know what became of poor Lois. For all I know, she'd picked up a bug in a dirty hot tub. Maybe it was diabetes, and maybe she'd had it for months, but was too busy to properly manage her health. Maybe it was a side effect of a systemic ailment that also tormented her with loud thumps no one else could hear, and made her hallucinate a shadowy man with an axe, standing over her bed. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for it all. A logical explanation that has nothing to do with the footless, pitch black man with a hatchet, buried under so many layers of paint and an antique chest of drawers, at the end of the hall on the second floor. There has to be. I'm not crazy, I don't believe in curses or ghosts, and I know a spray-painted figure couldn't possibly become sentient and turn a pair of perfectly normal feet into those blackened, bloated hunks of rotten meat jutting out from under Lois's nightgown. And I'm equally sure there's an equally logical explanation for what I saw, three days later, while zoning out at my desk at two in the morning, staring mindlessly at my shadow against the pale yellow wall across from me. I slumped on one arm. My shadow slumped on one arm. I drummed my fingers. My shadow drummed its fingers. Then, loud laughter, and the sound of the front door opening. A group of 40-something businessmen filed in, faces flushed, loudly debating some call made during the football game they just watched at the sports bar across the street. They didn't so much as look my way as they tromped across the lobby and up the stairs to their rooms. But they jolted me out of my half-asleep haze. A ton of bricks dropped in my stomach. A second later, my conscious mind caught up to my body's instinctive panic. My shadow was gone. The businessmen, as they'd cross the lobby, cast no shadows on the pale yellow wall. It would have been impossible for them, or me, to cast a shadow on the wall across from my desk. The light was in front of us. I snapped my head to the closing door. I looked just in time to see a pitch black body, like a three-dimensional silhouette, exit the hotel. I only saw it for a fraction of a second. But a long-fingered, completely opaque, human hand lingered on the doorframe for a millisecond more, before the figure disappeared into the night. I quit my job the next morning. Later, I took to the internet. I googled hatchet man graffiti, axe man plus black paint, scary graffiti plus axe and such for hours. It took a while. But I found a photograph on Reddit, the op claimed to have taken it at an abandoned facility in Maryland. The picture was of the crude black silhouette of a man, painted on cracked plaster, holding a spiked ball in one hand. He seemed to shoot out of a corner, and one of his arms was missing. I scrolled through the comments. The post was from 2014. The op had commented, once more, in 2017, to clarify that none of the urban explorers upvoting the thread should bother trying to find that abandoned facility in Maryland. It had been torn down after one of the op's exploring buddies contracted flesh-eating bacteria there. The poor guy's arm had to be amputated. The next Reddit photo I found had been taken at a foreclosed commercial warehouse in Epping, Victoria, Australia in 2012. It depicted a crude black silhouette of a man, painted 30 feet high on a cinder block wall. A sword dangled from one two-dimensional hand. This one was missing his head, cut off at the neck by the ceiling. I read the comments on this post as well, most of them were from disappointed adventurers who'd slept all the way to that abandoned warehouse, only to find that the silhouetted man with a sword was nowhere to be found. Then, the op rejoined the discussion. He'd apparently returned to the warehouse himself. To his surprise, he realized the disappointed adventurers were right, the black spray-painted man had disappeared. And it wasn't as though he'd been painted over. The cinder blocks of the walls were untouched. Hands trembling, icy tendrils tightening around my spine, I googled Epping Australia plus crime and Epping Australia plus fatal accident. With a burning rush of adrenaline, I deemed my hunch correct. On February 20, 2013, the body of a 26-year-old Australian woman, Jessica Fallow, was found on the side of a road. The crime was horrific, and still unsolved. Someone had, in one quick, precise swipe, beheaded Jessica with the brutal efficiency of a guillotine blade. I glanced back at Reddit. That foreclosed commercial warehouse was on the same street where Jessica's body had been found. And, based on the comments, after February 20, 2013, no one saw the headless silhouette man ever again. So, yeah. I'm sure there's a logical explanation for what happened at the La Do. Just like I'm sure there are logical explanations for what happened to the urban explorer in Maryland and Jessica Fallow in Australia. There's no way a two-dimensional army of spray-painted figures, wielding weapons, lurking in destitute places all over the world. And it would be utter fantasy to suggest these silhouette men are seeking out their missing appendages, and commandeering them from unsuspecting victims. Just. 
Be careful out there, will you?